Hi, this video is a result of me clearing up my own confusions about the foundations of physics. Especially, I want to get clear on the edge of knowledge. There are two such edges, one for what we know today, and one for what is possible for us to ever know. And then, there's likely to be stuff that we can never know, but that still exists. Now, there are lots of strong opinions on what we have here and here. And when people discuss it, they get vague. They talk about what the equations mean, how to understand or make sense of a theory, or what physics is telling us, or what's really going on. In this video, I want to define some terms. I want to make a distinction between a medium, like air, and a substratum, like an electromagnetic field. I also want to put so-called interpretations in this context and see how they relate to the edges of knowledge. But first, let's have a little fun. John Conway invented the game of life. We have a square grid of tiles that can be either black or white. At each tile, there's a logic box to decide what color it will have next. The box looks at the eight neighbors as input and produces an output. Now, the box itself can be implemented with Boolean gates. And the gates, in turn, can be implemented in different technologies, such as vacuum tubes, transistors, or even some mechanical device. Let's return to the tiles and zoom out our view, and add more tiles. It turns out that many patterns are stable, and some of them move. This pattern is called a glider. And this one is called a spaceship. Now, let's zoom out more, and we can imagine that there are large stable structures that we call atoms. And the atoms may come in different sizes. And they may join into something we call a molecule. Let's zoom out even more, and the molecules have replicated and evolved and formed two-dimensional people. Let's call them Albert II and Boris. And let's say their brains have evolved to be curious about their environment, and they develop their own two-dimensional physics. Hey, our fundamental theories seem to say space is made of pixels, and that they evolved according to Boolean gates. Oh yeah? But tell me, what are the gates made of? Well, the gates could be made of some three-dimensional version of vacuum tubes, or transistors, or even some mechanical device. But if you can never tell the difference, it's a waste of time to speculate. Just shut up and calculate. Let's go back to our diagram. The Boolean gates and the transistors, where do we put them? Well, from the point of view of Albert II and Boris, they know that there is a low level that behaves as Boolean gates, but they know nothing about them, and they can never tell the difference between vacuum tubes and transistors. On the other hand, from our point of view, both the Boolean gates and the transistors are known facts. We'll return to Albert II and Boris in a bit. First, let's look at three very similar situations. Here we have a loudspeaker and a microphone which is connected to a current detector. We notice that when the loudspeaker membrane moves at point A, then there's an effect over at point B after a delay. It's as if we have an X here and a function of X there. We can do a lot of experiments and figure out this function, but it turns out to be horribly complicated. But then we discover that if we create an intermediate variable, p, at every point in space. Then there is a simple equation for p that makes the math a lot simpler. p is just a calculational tool. This equation is the wave equation, just like we have for waves and water. Physics, then, seems to be telling us that there is an invisible medium obeying the wave equation. I know the suspense is unbearable, so I'll break it. There is a medium called air, and the membrane creates a pressure wave among the air molecules. 
Now, the thing about this medium, air, is that we can take it apart into molecules. And we can study these molecules in isolation. We can do things to the molecules, like shoot them at double slits or have a chemical reaction. We know a lot about the parts of the medium. This wasn't always the case. For example, Lord Kelvin speculated that what we call atoms are vortices in some deeper reality. Now let's look at a second situation that is similar. We have some charges here that affect what's going on there. Again, the math gets a lot easier if we create a variable called the four potential, because then, again, we have a wave equation. Physics again seems to be telling us that there is an invisible medium. Just like with air, the charges would affect nearby stuff which in turn affects nearby stuff, until a wave has spread to the charge on the right. Well, so what would this medium look like? Maxwell was speculating that there might be a hexagonal grid of vortices that give rise to his equations. As an alternative, we can imagine a grid of tiny particles connected by linear springs. In the limit of very tiny springs, this grid would obey the wave equation. But, and here's the crucial difference from air, we haven't found these vortices or particles. We haven't been able to take apart the electromagnetic field. We cannot break it into pieces and study those pieces in isolation. So we're not going to call this a medium. Instead, we're going to call it a substratum. A substratum looks like it could be made of smaller things, but we haven't found those things. We can speculate on different kinds of implementations, but we have no way to tell the difference. In our third situation, we have masses here that affect what happens there. Again, the mathematics get a lot easier if we create a variable called the space-time metric, because then it obeys Einstein's equations. Physics again seems to be telling us that there is an invisible medium the masses would affect nearby stuff, which in turn affects nearby stuff, until the wave has spread to the mass on the right. When you read about general relativity, space-time is often described as a fabric or a jello that deforms, and I have a series of videos visualizing space-time in this way. Such a jello obeys the same mathematics as general relativity. But again, we cannot take this fabric apart. We haven't detected any atoms of space-time. So the jello is a substratum. We can imagine other substrata for space-time. For example, instead of deforming in place, the fabric could be stiff and bulge out into a fifth dimension. I compare these two substrata in my other videos. So we have three similar cases. Sound in air, classical electrodynamics, and general relativity. And we said that only air has constituents that we know anything about. So air is not fundamental, it's a medium. On the other hand, the electromagnetic field and the space-time metric, they are fundamental. We can only guess what their substrata look like. Now, textbooks are full of images of the electromagnetic field and many of us may feel that it's somehow real. On the other hand, when space-time deforms, people often insist that space-time is not a real thing, that it's only a mathematical construct or something like that. But as we have seen, there's really no difference between the two, monologically. Both describe the behavior of matter, but we cannot say anything about how either one is implemented at a deeper level. What about the transistors underneath Game of Life? Well, to us who built the circuits, the transistors are a medium of computation. But to Albert II and Boris, within the Game of Life, transistors are a substratum. Now, if it's very natural to pick things apart to understand them better, this is called reductionism. A person is made of cells which are made of molecules, which are made of particles. 
These are different levels or different strata. And as we go deeper in the hierarchy, we feel that we understand better. There's a great quote by Lord Kelvin about reductionism. Do we or do we not understand a particular point in physics? The test is, can we make a mechanical model of it? Remember, it was Lord Kelvin who speculated about vortex atoms. Now, in the hierarchy here, we end with particles at the bottom, and they seem to be described by a wave function, psi. Let's compare the three theories. In classical electrodynamics, we have a four potential, and we can easily visualize it with electromagnetic fields, or an ether, or springs. In general relativity, we have a space-time metric, and we can visualize it as deforming jello, or as a stiff fabric in an external dimension. Now, in quantum theory, we have a wave function, but how on earth do we visualize it? The wave function itself lives in a high dimensional configuration space, but you could still describe the substratum in three or four dimensions. But what would that substratum look like? My next video is about such a visualization. I want to finish this video by talking about so-called interpretations of quantum theory. These interpretations usually live at the bottom of the diagram. They make claims about what is real, what the beables are, and how they change in time. A beable is a kind of hidden variable that gives rise to things we can know at a higher stratum. For Albert II, there could be different beables. Albert II has no way of telling the difference, ever. One class of interpretations are pilot wave theories. In the original version, they describe a substratum that exactly reproduces quantum mechanics at a higher level. However, David Bohm also suggested a modification to quantum mechanics for very small distances. In other words, interpretations can suggest new theory and then make new predictions that we can observe. So pilot wave theories don't always deal only with things we can never know, but sometimes they deal with things we can know. Another class of interpretations are collapse theories. They start out with modifying the Schrodinger equation, so they always sit across the edge of knowledge. Then there are many worlds interpretations, which tend to only sit outside the edge of knowledge. Now the Copenhagen interpretation is a kind of anti-interpretation. It avoids any speculation about what hidden things might exist. It only deals with what you can observe in experiments, things you can know. It's similar to the attitude of Boris. But if you can never tell the difference, it's a waste of time to speculate. Just shut up and calculate. So, interpretations and substrata, what are they good for? Well, first, as we just saw, they may propose new theory. Even if you start with a theory about hidden beables, you can then modify it, and perhaps you can predict a new phenomenon, or perhaps you can unify ideas that today look very different. The second thing is that a substratum can help visualize quantum theory. The visualization doesn't tell us what is really going on, as we saw with the electromagnetic field, but it helps us to learn a theory and to develop intuition for what a theory predicts. Especially, a good visualization should make you feel like quantum theory is not weird. That word, the W word, is one that I really dislike, and my personal goal is to develop a substratum that is not weird. This quantum substratum will initially live strictly beyond the edge of knowledge. In other words, for the quantum box here, can we have a strong, concrete visualization of quantum theory? Now, theories like pilot waves and spontaneous collapse can be visualized, but I don't see how to do so in a way that helps students learn quantum mechanics and to build intuition. In my opinion, 
those theories still leave quantum mechanics feeling weird. In the next several videos, I'll develop a quantum substratum. In the first video, we'll use it to understand the EPR paradox. The substratum violates Bell's inequality, as it should, but it is also a local substratum. To avoid confusion with how EPR is usually presented, I'll use the word for local instead of just local. I'll see you in the next video. For more videos, go to physicsisnotweird.com and I'm Aiden Bernander.